नमस्कार आई शुभ्रापन कोठारी फ्रॉम द सेंटर फॉर ग्लोबल स्टडीज परिवार टेक दिस प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑल टू द फर्स्ट सेंटर फॉर ग्लोबल स्टडीज एम्बेसडोरियल लेक्चर ऑन इंडिया उजबेकिस्तान रिलेशंस इन कंटेम्प्रेरी टाइम्स कन्वर्जेंस फ्रॉम कन्वर्जेंस टू कॉन्फ्लुएंस सेंटर फॉर ग्लोबल स्टडीज एम्बेसडोरियल लेक्चर सीरीज इज एन इनिशिएटिव टू एक्सचेंज global perspectives on different themes among nations uh, themes and perspectives um, taken among nations to grace this occasion today we have among us our keynote speaker ambassador of india to uzbekistan ambassador manish prabhak sir we welcome you we welcome you namaskar no, India and Uzbekistan uh, have relations that go back in the history and recently there has been significant intensification in bilateral ties when our honorable prime minister visited in uh, Uzbekistan in 2015 and in 2016 uh, he visited Tashkent bilateral is that encompasses a wider perspective when explores many themes uh, between the countries and to explore these dimensions and to give us enlighten us with a wider knowledge about the two countries we have our keynote speaker who will be divulging on these issues talking about our center for global studies center our visionary director professor sunil chaudhary has always taken immense efforts in initiating a platform for academic deliberation that acknowledges exchange of knowledge and in this direction a new feather was added to the cap with the change of the required nomenclature of our prestigious institution of delhi university De developing countries research center to the center for global studies in 2021 the center for global studies formerly known as developing countries research center is a common platform for students scholars fellows and faculties all across discipline and is engaged in the enhancement of knowledge and research its ethos are based on being academically vibrant by vibrant in the global society and with a, with this vision our director has initiated several programs to achieve this from conducting focused electoral surveys on uh, like samiksha to uh, exchange of academic exchange of different topics related to inter uh, in international conferences and national conferences and also we have incepted knowledge through producing en enlightened journals and newsletter and all this and more has happened under the guidance and dynamic leadership of our director pratham sevak professor sunil chaudhary sir who has kept the morale of fellows and researchers high by putting tremendous effort to develop the center one of its own kind in the research organizations now i would like to invite sir to kindly present the directorial address over to right. professor sunil chaudhary thank you shubhra uh, namaste india namaste uzbekistan assalam alaikum uzbekistan assalam alaikum hindustan honorable ambassador of india to uzbekistan श्री मनीष प्रभात जी मई फेलो टू नवरत्नास कुलीग्स फ्रॉम यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ दिल्ली कॉलेजेस एंड डिपार्टमेंट्स स्कॉलर्स एंड स्टूडेंट्स लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ सेंटर फॉर ग्लोबल स्टडीज यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ दिल्ली आई प्रथम सेवर द वन हु इज द फर्स्ट टू सर्व वेलकम यू ऑल टू अवर फर्स्ट ambassadorial lecture series friends since our inception in 1990 as the developing countries research center to the center for global studies we have 
made a huge transformative journey addressing new issues and concerns changes and challenges continuities and consistencies in the areas of research publications and many other domains of social service i am very happy to announce today that today is very important day for us besides being having the very first lecture from ambassador manish prabha ji the another important news which actually justifies our transformation from the developing countries research center to the center for global studies is that our two important publications sanslation that is a hindi monthly hindi magazine of the center as well as our by annual research journal called globalist a journal of social science research both these publications have actually got the approval from rni office that is registrar of newspapers for india we have got this approval today itself so that justifies our transformation from uh, our platform working at a national arena to a global arena i must acknowledge that this initiative for taking the very first initiative towards global platform has been taken by our fellow uh, colleague and deputy director of the center dr bhuvan jha we wanted to make something uh, new in the era of global initiatives specifically in the, in the context of social science research public policy formulation and execution as our honorable vice chancellor prof pc joshi had rightly stated since we have now converted into a global center let's make a beginning so this is our first important beginning in true sense of the term that from national to global our first broad initiative of having this ambassadorial lecture series on different aspects with different ambassadors uh, who are actually the catalyst of change in different parts of the globe let me first uh, admit that my professor and mentor professor yogesh atal had once stated that india could be seen in globe and globe could be seen in india as well so this is a convergence of india in globe and globe in india from post 1990s one could see this era of liberalization privatization and globalization with this globalization which professor atal had rightly stated about an m3 phenomenon which is a movement of man movement of materials and movement of masses so this globalization in terms of speedy movement of man masses and materials has actually transformed the very nature of economies the societies the polities including the academia from this perspective one could see how it is important for us as a research center as a social science research center to study the issues and interests which have been converging between among nations particularly between india and the countries of the globe to study this specific perspective to encapsulate this kind of change in transformation the center has initiated the ambassadorial lecture series to find out how indian diasporic communities have been working in the host societies the convergence of interests and uh the issues between the host societies and the parent societies how one could see this changing nature of the multicultural societies from that perspective our honorable uh, ambassadors who have been working in different parts of the globe could actually glance us to make us enlightened and rejuvenated about this transformations and we must also acknowledge that our honorable ambassadors in all parts of the world are the real catalyst of change they are there to basically enhance increase and intensify the vision of government of india as well as the mission of the government of india on this issue we have got with us and we are very happy to have with us honorable ambassador shri manish prabha ji who is very kind to accept our invitation to be a part of this big broad and comprehensive global interactions and we know that our uh, scholars and students fellows and faculty and all those who are part of this important event would be enriched 
with his ideas on the issue, on the topic and on the perspective with which we have been working. And I think very few people might be knowing that how Uzbekistan could have been a very important uh, uh, friend, very important partner, very important nation, specifically in the context of Central Asian region uh, in the aftermath of disintegration of Soviet Union. It is not only that the Silk Route was very important connecting the East and the West, which got uh, linked with India and uh, Uzbekistan. But besides that, one could also see uh, many converging issues and even confluence of interests between these two important nations, making the entire uh, study, making the entire uh, uh, work uh, to be seen from a new perspective in 21st century, uh, the global world. Uh, our Honorable uh, Prime Minister Pandit Nehruji made the first visit to Uzbekistan, that is Tashkent. We did have uh, uh, our Prime Minister Honorable uh, Lal Bahadur Shastriji. That we had Dr. Manmohan Singh ji and again uh, Sri Narendra Modi ji. So we could also see the reciprocation from the heads of the states and heads of the government from Uzbekistan to India. That shows how the relationship between the two are shifting, not only in terms of, say, the convergence of issues, but we could also see we've reached a stage where uh, the convergence of issues have not transformed into confluence of interests. So uh, I think we have got with us Honorable Ambassador sir, to throw more light on us and on this issue and enlighten us on the relationship between these two nations and how we could learn more from each other's interactions, how these interactions could be uh, very beneficial for us as research scholars, at fellows and faculty, so that we can unfold new dimensions of research in these two countries. So I once again welcome you, Ambassador Sir, for our first ambassadorial lecture series and uh, the entire CGS Parivar, the Center for Global Studies Parivar, acknowledges its gratitude in welcoming you to this important event. Thank you so much. Namaste, Namaskar, Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. Uh, rightly said as that converging towards understanding the not only the history, but the co-influence that we need to see towards the future uh, uh, relationship between India and Uzbekistan. We had, I take this privilege to invite our keynote speaker, Ambassador Sir Manish Prabhat, sir. Manish Prabhat, sir, is a career diplomat who has served in the Ministry of External Affairs and India's missions abroad in Moscow, Washington, D.C., Milan, Paris. Sir is currently the ambassador of India to Uzbekistan. He joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1996 and is the alumnus of University of Delhi. As a bright scholar and a friendly personality, I invite you, sir, to explore the india Uzbekistan relation and to address this uh, and to address this lecture. The enlightened lecture will be of 45 to 50 minutes duration. And after that, we'll be having uh, interaction with the follow, uh, fellows and audience and participants. Welcome you, sir, on board. And Namaskar, everybody. Good afternoon from Ashkan. Uh, thank you, uh, Shubhraji, for uh, your very warm welcome. Uh, I uh, bring my greetings to all the members of the Center for Global Studies and all those who are present today who have joined this session. Uh, thank you, Professor Sunil Trotti, the director of the center, uh, to have invited me for this very first ambassadorial interaction. As I understand that there's a new phase in the center uh, to know more about the world from uh, a global perspective, not only from the perspective of developing countries. I also thank my friend, uh, Mr. Bhuvan Jha, old university friend from student days, and it is very nice to reconnect and uh, get back uh, to and reminisce about our days back when we were still students in Delhi University. It is always very special when you speak to your own family, your own university, and uh, you know it feels very good. Uh, I think that you know uh, I can talk uh, today about uh, India-Uzbekistan relations and 
probably it would add to you know everybody's understanding of this part of the world and of course uh, it's an important issue and important thing to know and perhaps uh, you know uh, uh, after my talk of course i look forward to and uh, of course it would this is not only one sided of course it would add to my knowledge also and you know uh, to listen to your comments your views uh, you know your your ideas and of course it would help ultimately in my work as a master of india to uzbekistan uh, so friends uh, let me begin by saying that you know uh, uzbekistan uh, is a country in central asia which is uh, you know uh, very close to india not only in terms of our relationship or friendship going back to ages but but also geographically and uh, you know we uh, probably do not realize that uh, it has been one of our neighboring neighboring civilizations from very ancient times and uh, you know it was very natural that india and uzbekistan of course it was not for uzbekistan then but this part of the world always interacted throughout history uh, let me uh, tell you that uh, in um, you know in the south of uzbekistan uh, there is a place called termiz there is a city of termiz uh, which borders uh, you know which is on the border of uh, uzbekistan and afghanistan uh, just across uh, amudarya uh, well amudarya deline almost delineates the frontier between uzbekistan and afghanistan and on this part of uh, amudarya from the uzbek side lies the city of termiz in 1930s soviet archaeologists excavated in termiz and found the remains of buddhist monasteries uh, these uh, places are there plenty you know these are called uh, fayaz tippa and kara tippa and these excavations show loud show light on a very flourishing uh, you know uh, uh, this existence of monasteries the monks it uh, brought out uh, beautiful statues of buddha in fact one such large statue is in the uh, you know in the state museum of history in pashkan and uh, of course there are uh, you know many other finds uh, you know uh, frescoes uh, you know uh, paintings uh, figurines of bodhisattvas and you know pottery and you know uh, a lot of other ritual and uh, you know ritualistic and other kinds of objects well it showed that uh, you know uh, there was a very flourishing buddhist uh, you know colony in in termiz uh, from 1st century to 4th century ad this is the time of the kushana empire and uh, you know as you know that uh, during the kushana empire you know the uh the part of the empire extended all the way to northern india and uh, probably at that time it was politically one unit and uh, this uh, shows and as historians have interpreted and uh, you know uh, uh, went into those uh, finds etc what has been established as that buddhism buddhism traveled to this part of the world of course from india uh, through afghanistan uh, that was the route and from termiz it actually went eastwards it went to china and then further to japan korea etc so you know if we look at the ancient links between india and uzbekistan it goes back to prehistoric period uh, you know of course these finds come from first century ad but I, of course you know the links would have been there earlier also and as we all know that uh, uzbekistan or the you know countries of central asia or this geographical region actually lay at the heart of the ancient silk route uh, you know of course or we call it silk and spice route because spices went from india so you know uh, the uh, goods going from china to europe of course passed through this part of the world uh, you know the spices and you know other things coming from india also passed through this part of the world samarkand bukhara etc were all very flourishing centers and would have seen the trade caravans uh, going you know with uh, you know traders and and goods and ideas and of course it would have led to very vibrant exchanges of ideas in terms of uh, you know philosophy religion uh, literature cuisine of course i mean that you know even even today uh, you know between uh, you know uh, between uzbek language and hindi or urdu you would have thousands of common word com common words Uh, so you know it's a discovery that you know what we speak you know the uzbek people are speaking and using the same words and of course there's a common history behind that uh, you know uh, come uh, down to you know a little go down uh, further in history you know around the 6th century ad 
uh, Samarkand was a very flourishing city, and you know the uh, excavations in Samarkand have shown you know the place was called uh, Afrasiab, and there's a beautiful fresco. Uh, you know, which was uh, excavated in Samarkand and it is preserved in a museum in Samarkand, which shows that, you know, empire, the, the ambassadors from different countries are coming to the king to present their, you know, goods and, uh, you know, gifts, etc. There are people coming from China, people coming from Korea, and people coming from India. So also, you know, it, it uh, you know, it vividly captures that, you know, how, you know, it would have been or they would have considered themselves the center of the world where people from different parts of the world were converging. So, of course, you know, it, it lay right down there in the heart of uh, the Silk Road. Uh, you know, later, you know, uh, with the coming of uh, advent of Islam, there was an Arab invasion of uh, this part of the world. Later, the Turks came. Uh, we know of the campaigns of uh, Amir Temur. Uh, you know, he is, uh, you know, he is referred to as Amir Temur in, in Uzbekistan now. So his campaigns to all part of the world, including in Delhi, including to Delhi, and uh, later, you know, the, the coming of Babur himself from, uh, you know, Babur belonged to, uh, he was born in Andijan in Uzbekistan, and and he also, you know, uh, uh, he also came to India through through Kabul, and the rest is history. He founded the great uh, Mughal Empire. And so, you know, there was a very living link between India and Uzbekistan at that time. Of course, the Mughal court would have acted as the patron court where it would have attracted all the talents of the world at that time. And from Uzbekistan also, you know, many people would have traveled to India. And of course, this was a two-way street. People would have, uh, and traders had gone from India to this part of the world. Uh, Mirza Ghalib's family actually came from Samarkand. And, you know, uh, and, and the list can go on, on and on. Uh, during the uh, you know colonial period, with the coming of the British Empire and the expansion of the Russian Empire, actually, then this the whole region you know falls into the definition of the Great Game and how the empires were serving their political interests and trying to ward off each other. And that is practically the period when this uh, link between India and Uzbekistan was stopping or at least halting, and and you know the. Exchanges were not there, you know, anymore as uh, vibrant as they were in history. And finally, with the coming of uh, independence of, of India and our partition itself, a very tragic thing happened that with the creation of Pakistan, we lost any direct contact with Central Asia. While geographically we had direct contact with Central Asia, and uh, you know, and uh, you must understand and let us visualize on the map that. Countries like Iran and Afghanistan were our direct neighbors. Today, we do not share geographical border with them uh, because there is another country in between, and that country denies you overland transit to reach to this part of the world. And so, in a sense, we have lost the living links with countries, you know, in Central Asia. That today are of exotic country lying somewhere and why I should in India be bothered about it. But you would uh, you know, be very surprised to know that it is a country which has actually been our neighbor. It's just with the changed circumstances of the contempt with them. But today we are trying to reconnect and rediscover those roots actually. In fact, uh, you know, a direct flight from Delhi to Tashkent is actually less than three hours. You know, that is even less than, you know, the time taken by you to travel to Chennai from Delhi. And so you can understand that, you know, how close Uzbekistan is. In fact, I am 30 minutes behind, behind your time. And so we are practically, you know, in, in the same, you know, time zone, in the same geographical. So in this kind of uh, scenario, when finally, uh, you know, uh, this change happened after 1947, India became independent. We were, you know, very good friends with the Soviet Union. And all these Central Asian countries were then Soviet republics. And we had a very special connection with Uzbekistan even then. Of course, there were visits by, you know, Prime Minister uh, Shri Jawaharlal Nehru, later Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri, who unfortunately passed away in Tashkent uh, in 1966. His, uh, there are two beautiful monuments commemorating Lal Bahadur Shastri here and the streets named after him. Uh, you know, later we, of course, had uh, you know, the Prime Minister uh, Rao, 
uh, you know, uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, uh, you know, and Prime Minister Shingrens Modi in, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, uh, you know, just five years back, uh, you would be, of course, you know, there was this realization among the people of Uzbekistan also that you know, India connects very closely with Uzbek history, uh, you know, with Babur, and uh, you know a lot of uh, you know cultural exchanges earlier, and you would be uh, you know very happy to know, or rather you know it was very surprising that of course Indian films used to be very popular in Soviet Union, and uh, you know the, the the Tashkent International Film Festival even during Soviet times routinely and regularly attracted Indian film stars to come here. Raj Kapoor is a household name in Uzbekistan, and you know the songs like Avara Hu or Mera Juta Hai Japani, you know it, you will. At least in the older generation, everybody knows. Uh, the younger generation also knows, but you know a, a little less so. And uh, you know there were you know films like uh, uh, you know Mithun Chakravarti's Disco Dancer broke all records. It was a great hit in Soviet Union. He remains the probably the you know the the best known living star uh, you know uh, among you know etched in the minds of Uzbeks or in, rather the you know countries of the ex Soviet Union. Uh, he was recently here in the Tashkent Film Festival, which was held in Tashkent in, uh, in September, October, and and you know uh, you know there was this rekindling of uh, old links of uh, films also. So of course you know there were there was a great uh, friendship and uh, you know uh, uh, you know a feeling for each other uh, you know between people of India and Uzbekistan, and uh, of course when Uzbekistan uh, you know became an independent country in 1991 after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And uh, this part of Central Asia was, uh, you know, suddenly there were five new states. In the, I'm talking only of Central Asia, of course, Soviet Union was, uh, you know, there were 15 constituent republics. So in uh, Central Asia, we have uh, Uzbekistan, of course, uh, also Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan. We have good relations with all of them, uh, with all the Central Asian countries and, and more or less, you know, when I speak about uh, many features of Uzbekistan, it is also true of Central Asia. So in 1992, you know, India quickly established diplomatic relations with Uzbekistan. And now our relationship with Uzbekistan, uh, you know, uh, was direct. It was no longer through Moscow. And, you know, here is a country, you know, with uh, which we have shared very old history. And they, were, they have been civilizational links. And now we are dealing with them on an independent state to state relations. And of course, you know, the, the first, uh, uh, you know, uh, Uzbekistan this year is celebrating its 30th uh, anniversary of independence. In India, we are celebrating our 75th, you know, anniversary of independence by, uh, you know, by initiating Azadi Kamrat also. So as you see that, you know, anniversaries coincide and, and we are been, you know, we have been uh, talking to each other and doing a lot together diplomatically. And it's uh, it's a good a step or a stage in our relationship where we stop, look back, commemorate, you know, how it all began 30 years ago. Of course, you know, civilizationally, it would have began, began probably 2,500 years ago, but and the goodwill which has, which has existed between our two peoples has you know provided us uh, we are now trying to find the modern reverberations or you know how we you know combine our uh, efforts uh, you know to uh, to you know for our bilateral relations for our multilateral relations you know tackle the global and uh, you know uh, our, our regional challenges and how we do all that so of course you know there was uh, we were always talking of uh, you know relationship with central asia you know, in 2015, uh, there was a new focus when, uh, you know, Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi paid a very historic visit to Central Asia in July of 2015. Uh, he visited all the five Central Asian countries. It was a back-to-back -back visit, you know. So, you know, the visit ended in this country and the next day it started in another country. And that is how he toured all the five countries. And I think that, you know, there would be seldom any other example of a foreign leader, you know, you know, uh, doing a back to back to back visit of uh, five Central Asian countries in one go, and all the countries opened their doors, and it simply shows that the respect and love and friendship towards India, which is felt in Central Asia, that all the countries were ready to accommodate, you know, uh, Prime Minister's visit, and you know, it led to very fruitful talks.
Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi came to Tashkent again in 2016. And uh, around that time, uh, you know, another factor, you know, or, you know, another coincidence was happening. Uh, President Shavkat Mirziyayev uh, came to power in Uzbekistan. Uh, you know, there was uh, uh, President Islam Karimov uh, passed away and, you know, his place was taken by President uh, Mirziyayev. There were elections, he was elected. And the President Mirziyayev uh, realized that time has come, you know, with so many years of Uzbekistan's independence to bring in more reforms for Uzbekistan. He has been a reform-minded president. He has been recognized as such a global leader. So he immediately started to bring in reforms and started to change the national life of Uzbekistan. So there were reforms in the domestic political sphere, there were reforms in the economical sphere, and also there were reforms and new directions in the foreign policy. So, for example, you know, in political sphere, he talked of democratizing Uzbekistan, more democracy, more people's participation in politics, uh, changing the electoral laws, uh, trying to broad base the elections, uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, uh, lift any restrictions on media. Uh, media was asked to be more vocal, uh, you know, write more truthfully, be, you know, be more even criticizing if they found something wrong with the government or you know officials or corruption uh, you know uh, there were reforms relating to you know the the parliament the central election commission and everything and uh, you know um, uh, reforms of bureaucracy trying to think make things easier reforms of uh, you know economic sphere you know at there was a controlled currency regime during the time of uh, you know president karimov uh, president mirzia yev changed that and uh, you know suddenly when he uh, you know uh, removed the restrictions on the uh, exchange rate of the currency the uzbek currency sum lost 100% of its value actually you know if there was 4000 sum to a dollar overnight it became 8000 sum to a dollar people thought that uzbekistan's economy would not survive but it, that has not ha happened and the economy is rather, you know, doing well. Doing well. Uh, his emphasis was on to attract uh, more foreign direct investment, uh, trying to, uh, you know, uh, improve uh, entrepreneurship in Uzbekistan. And as a result, what happened that Uzbekistan jumped many places in the ease of doing business ranking from the position of uh, somewhere in 90s, it became like uh, 69. And so, you know, there were these showed that, you know, the, the Uzbek economy was opening. Of course, it's not that all challenges are gone. The reforms, you know, they are a continuing process. They're still going on. But I think that, you know, with Uzbekistan opening up, there was a lot of opportunities for to also engage with the wider world. Similarly, President Mirziyev uh, said that you know, uh, Uzbekistan would work with all its foreign partners. And so there were, you know, intensification of relationship with, uh, you know, big powers in this region like Russia and China. Of course, he has not hesitated to, uh, you know, have good relationship with United States. And similarly, you know, countries of uh, European Union, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the uh, immediate neighborhood he has emphasized on uh, relationship of good neighborliness with all the neighboring countries. And, you know, there were kind of, uh, you know, uh, blocks and obstacles uh, during President Karimov's time between, uh, you know, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, borders being closed. There were problems of border, you know, markings and limitations, uh, you know, problems between Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. And all these are quickly being resolved now. Uh, President Mirzaev decided that, you know, in the spirit of, a good neighborliness in Central Asia, we should try to take region together, open up relationship with more. And in that uh, context, he also emphasized that we have important things to learn from India and let us have our strategic partnership with India going in a bigger way. So India and Uzbekistan uh, in right back in 2011 had declared their relationship as that of a strategic partnership. But President Mirziyev said, uh, you know, came and said that, you know, let us do something which really gives meaning to this strategic partnership and try to expand relationship in you know in all spheres. And so you know what is uh, what was the result that you know there is this focus on uh, Central Asia. Uh, Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi himself travels to Central Asia and he comes to Uzbekistan twice. And then President Mirziyoyev opens up Uzbekistan and he also comes to India twice. So in October uh, 2018, uh, President Mirziyoyev 
came on a state visit to India. I was a joint secretary then in Ministry of External Affairs in Delhi. I was directly handling the visit. And then what happened that uh, just six months, within six months after that, there was the vibrant Gujarat summit in Gandhinagar in January 2019. And President Mirziyayev came as an honored guest there also. So, you know, within a span of six months, coming to India twice by a head of state, signaled a strong desire on the part of Uzbekistan that they value this relationship with India and they really want to do a lot of things with us. And that really give, you know, gave a great fillip to relationship between India and Uzbekistan. And many things started to happen. I mean, it's not that things were not happening before, but now there was a renewed zeal from both sides that, you know, how we take up, take our relationship forward. So in different areas, it meant, uh, you know, uh, expansion and widening of our relationship. For example, in the field of, uh, you know, political relations, I mean, that, you know, there are numerous uh, regular uh, exchanges at the political level between two countries, which means that leadership is always talking to each other. We are in close contact and we are always exchanging opinion and, uh, you know, strategizing that, you know, how we can do things together. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, two visits by prime minister, uh, our prime minister, two visits by president of Uzbekistan to India. And uh, there was also the planning to have the visit of Prime Minister Shri Modi to Uzbekistan in 2020. But the conditions of pandemic did not allow that. And so in December of 2020, there was a virtual summit, you know, online summit between President of Uzbekistan and Prime Minister of India. And so we had a virtual summit. And so we did not allow that continued exchanges to break. And so, you know, you can see that even at the level of... Uh, you know, heads of government, head of government and head of state, you know, on the other side, the exchanges have been constant. In fact, this year, External Affairs Minister Dr. Jay Shankar and uh, Foreign Minister of Uzbekistan, Mr. Abdul Aziz Kamilo, have met, uh, you know, four or five times already. And, uh, you know, you can understand that, you know, the foreign ministers are regularly meeting, prime minister and president are, you know, exchanging visits or, you know, are, uh, you know, writing to each other and, you know, having even virtual summit. Uh, there are other high-level visits of, uh, you know, ministerial nature. Uh, Minister of State for External Affairs, uh, Srimati Minakshi Lekhi, came on her first visit to Uzbekistan in September. So, you know, these are, these are you know, th these showed that, you know, there's so much of attention being focused from the leadership of both sides. Of course, the pandemic conditions had, uh, you know, uh, reduced the possibility of travel, but now those conditions are being relaxed. And our political pace of relationship has actually picked up and it shows that you know politically we are very comfortable with each other talking to each other we have not hesitated if there are any you know conditions of uh, you know uh, complexity and we have uh, talked to each other and that is how if you start talking to each other half of the things are resolved uh, uh, what happened in the field of defense cooperation uh, in 2019 uh, of our uh, then our defense minister Sri Rajnath Singh was visiting uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, during that visit, we had the first ever joint military exercise between India and Uzbekistan. It was called Dustalik, which means Dosti in Hindi. And uh, so Dustalik first edition was held in Uzbekistan in 2019, and Dustalik two was held in India this year. In fact, right now we are now also planning to hold the next round of joint military exercises. And this joint military exercise, it focused on uh, counter-terrorism, which is a very important issue, you know, for both countries. And of course, it's a, it's a concern for our region. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, Uzbek defense officers are now being trained in India. We have opened our institutions like National Defense Academy, Indian Military Academy, and a lot of other, you know, short-term and medium-term defense courses are now available for Uzbek military officers and cadets to come to India and train. Uh, in fact, we are also thinking of how to cooperate more in terms of industrial production, you know, purchase of defense equipment, uh, you know, and, and what we can do more. So, you know, this relationship was also vitalized and uh, it shows that, you know, you are strategically, you are comfortable with each other. There are no problems. And in that scenario, the defense cooperation also goes forward. Uh, in the field, of uh, cultural cooperation and uh, educational cooperation, a lot of things happening, uh, you know, and it is very interesting to know, uh, you know, uh, of course, Uzbek, uh, uh, you know, the Uzbek people have a great fascination for Indian films. They have a lot of admi admiration for Indian culture. 
and of course uh, things relating to india is very you know dear to their heart and they always would like to know more about india uh, you would be happy to know that in in uh, ashkan there is an indian cultural center uh, which is called lal bahadur shastri center for indian culture it is run by the indian council for cultural relations iccr and uh, last year the center completed its 25 years of existence uh, you know so you know this center uh runs uh, you know and is offers regular classes in uh, in uh, hindi language uh, teaching hindi uh, you know uh, teaching kathak uh, yoga uh, tabla and things like that and you know the, there are regular classes being held seminars you know uh, showing of films uh, you know all that happened it has a library and lot of uzbeks come to learn hindi language uh, you know uh, uh, the tashkent state university for uh, oriental studies you know which was earlier an institute uh, uh, you know is running uh, uh, hindi classes and the hindi faculty since 1947 you know even i was surprised to know when i came to know of this and there are some other institutions there is a lal bahadur shastri school in tashkent which is a government school in tashkent which was named later in the honor of lal bahadur shastri otherwise it is school number 24 and it has adopted hindi as its foreign language so since 1970s you know it is uh, you know the the other foreign language which is being taught in the school so you know students are taught uzbek and hindi and so we have about more than 700 or 600 students of uh, school students of hindi you know who who are you know uh, uh, learning hindi there and you know this provides uh, the ready basis for the next generation leaders of uzbekistan who would be india lovers i mean that you know these are the people who would go you know when they grow up take their important positions they take the relationship forward and of course among them since the school is very old now we have many leading professors lecturers and researchers in hindi language you know who have been you know working in hindi there there has been a regular radio show called namaste hindustan you know which which is uh, you know broadcasted here there are tv shows like which is called hindi show and of course there's a great fascination of bollywood Uh, of course yoga is getting more and more popular there is a yoga federation of uzbekistan and uh, president mirziyev when he met uh, prime minister shri modi in delhi again in that 2018 october visit he requested specifically for a yoga teacher from india to come and uh, you know help them establish the yoga federation of uzbekistan so this year the iccr sent a yoga teacher who is now here and he actually takes yoga classes here and you know and uh, there are plans to popularize and propagate yoga in all parts of uh, uzbekistan all regions of uzbekistan so things like that you know give a uh, lot of ready made base you know of that goodwill the indian diaspora you know there's a small indian diaspora of about 300 uh, indians in tashkent or about about 1800 indians in in entire uzbekistan they are uh, you know there are things they are in things like uh, business especially pharmaceuticals they are entrepreneurs you know there are professors teachers who are teaching in different universities here and and they make the basis of the indian diaspora they also be they are also very active and work for the betterment of relationship and this friendship between india and uzbekistan there are a lot of things happening in the field of education uh, you know uh, uzbekistan's population is about 35 million it is the largest country in central asia in terms of population and uh, this population is mostly youth it is said that you no know, probably 70% of uzbek population is less than 25 and uh, you know this youth actually when it comes to college after finishing school it is today because uzbekistan is opening uh, reforms they are looking for new kinds of uh, education vocational education business studies uh, finance engineering of course you know and a lot of teaching of english language in fact is a Uh, there is a great uh, move now in uzbekistan to popularize english language apart from russian which had existed before and apart from uzbek which is the national language but to connect wide with the wider world and for uh, business purposes it is important to know english and uh, this generation is working hard to acquire that skill also and so there are all new kinds of educational opportunities for which they are very uh, you know uh, uh, you know eager about and in this uh, scenario the uzbek government welcomes uh, universities from abroad to come and open their campuses in uzbekistan and there are three indian private universities which are already running their classes in uzbekistan so there is uh, amity university in tashkent there is sharda university in andijan 
and there is sambram university from bangalore which is in jizza and of course more universities are interested and they want to come and you know you can understand that in terms of uh, providing the indian education uh, or you know the the, the knowledge uh, the, the sector of knowledge it is a great uh, opportunity of this service sector okay. where we can really one uh, has the demand for you know uh, education in in uzbekistan and so you know we are uh, look looking at uh, you know uh, uzbekistan in many different ways in fact uh, you know uh, uh, when the uh, when uzbek president came to india he also you know uh, said that we want to learn more from india's uh, it prowess and uh, if we can have an it specialist from india to open the first it park in uzbekistan and so in 2019 uh, you know an indian uh, expert from the software technology parks of india was sent by government of india at the cost of uzbek government of course and they you know together they put their minds together and first it park was opened in tashkan in uh, 2019 then other it parks have also been opened after that and so you know in the field of it and the it related services uzbekistan looks at india for more training and more education and more opportunities in fact you probably would be aware government of india uh, you know and, and ministry of external affairs actually runs a program called indian uh, technical and economic partnership it's called itech and under itech foreign uh, you know officials uh, you know and uh, you know bureaucrats and others are invited to india under a 100% uh, you know uh, cost uh, on the basis of cost borne by government of india to have long the medium term short term courses in india in various kinds of fields and uh, since the independence of uzbekistan we have trained 2500 uzbek officials in india you know under different kinds of courses they can be you know public administration they can be you know management business uh, you know even uh, you know a technical kind of thing on a factory in a factory and all kind of thing and iccr also offers a scholarship for foreign students to come and study in delhi in fact there are many uzbek students who are studying in delhi university uh, you know under iccr scholarship and many of them are also on self financed basis so this is an exciting area of cooperation education is an exciting area of cooperation between india and uzbekistan a lot of them also go to learn hindi uh, just because of the fascination uh, with hindi language now if we in this backdrop when we talk of our you know economic uh, relationship the trade and investment then we find that what we have today is not up to the potential the india uzbekistan trade is somewhere around 300 million dollars annually uh, you know uh, as per uzbek figures it is a little more there is some uh, disparity in figures by the two countries but the both countries have set up a target the leaders have set the target of uh, reaching 1 billion dollar of bilateral trade annually and of course you know to to get there you have to work hard and and do a lot more than what is at this moment happening so what happened that the department of commerce of government of india and the ministry of investment and foreign trade of government of uzbekistan they put together their minds and they have prepared a joint feasibility study it is called jfs a joint feasibility study which has uh, become ready it it is to be signed and then released in public and this joint feasibility study Uh, has found that uh, in terms of our uh, complementarities and uh, you know commodities etc there is a very good basis probably to start negotiations for a preferential trading agreement between india and uzbekistan so if we get into a pta probably it would provide a great boost to bilateral trade and our trade uh, can grow uh, from both sides similarly in terms of investment of course there is some indian investment here uh, not large but uh, and uh, probably there would be a small bit of uzbek investment in india i am not sure but uh, both countries are currently negotiating with each other on a draft bilateral investment treaty which would protect investments at this moment we don't have that uh, but negotiations are going on in that uh, uh, you know area also now uh, if we look at this a small quantity of trade which is of about 300 million dollars today you know uh, of course you know you would be concerned that you know if we have such a good relationship and all the ingredients of good relationship is there then why trade volume is so low and in today's world actually trade provides the meat of the relationship 
in many senses you know it's a time of economic diplomacy and of course both countries want to increase their trade uh, relationship what is the biggest challenge here basically is the problem of the overland connectivity there is at this moment not much of a good you know established overland trade route between india and central asia so you know we go back to the days of uh, silk routes and spice routes you know when trade used to happen on during that today you, we are cut off geographically from central asia because a country in between would not allow goods to go to and fro and so you uh, you have to be, become innovative and try to find the way that how your goods can reach central asia now of course you know uh, if today you know or you know uh, uh, you know even in terms of uh, sending our goods to russia the most established route was and probably it remains even till today is that container containers would leave the port of uh, mumbai you know or you know ports from gujarat so of course you know from western india these containers would travel you know to mediterranean of course they would cross you know uh, you know the suez and all that it would come to mediterranean it would skirt the entire western europe go north and reach the port of st petersburg or the ports in baltics and uh, you can understand that this is such a long route and from there the goods would then travel downwards you know southwards basically uh, in russia uh, through rail or road and then they can cross russia they can reach russia or they can come further down south and then reach central asia so you can understand that this is a very long route you know where containers take uh, you know in normal times they took uh, you know two months Uh, to reach and the cost was that much more uh, and the other route was that actually you would ship your goods from india to uh, you know uh, to the eastern coast of china ports like shanghai and from there you know established railway route of course china did a lot in there in that uh, you know in the region uh, for connectivity and you know through these routes goods would come passing the traversing entire territory of china and then enter central asia so you can understand that you know you are uh, to 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 touch your nose basically you have to put your hand around your other ear and then reach your nose so it, it's something like that and the, while you are so close so uh, you know uh, in in 2000 actually uh, you know the problem of regional connectivity which did not exist uh, and when we were thinking of even trade between india and russia even in the year 2000 india was one of the earliest countries in terms of thinking of regional connectivity in the year 2000 we started something which is called international north south transport corridor instc and india iran and russia became the founding members of the instc today uh, 14 countries are members of the international north south transport corridor so under international north south transport corridor the idea was very simple that you know goods would go from the port of mumbai to the port of chaba uh, to the port of bandar abbas in iran and from there it can travel northward uh, you know on lorries trucks or railways and then reach the port of st petersburg when the pilot studies were done it was found that you know goods were reaching from bombay to st petersburg within 3 weeks and the cost was uh, you know 30% less than the cost you know uh, going through you know entire northern europe and so this made sense and of course the work started in this direction by filling up the infrastructure gap making railway lines etc a lot of things happened in iran in azerbaijan others the route is there but it's still not very popular because you know it is still not complete and there are you know the customs administration of countries keep meeting and they're trying to devise ways that you know how we can minimize time how there can be advanced exchange of information of what is traveling inside the container of course The last two years, uh, you know, COVID also took its toll, and the work really slowed down. The thing was that India started to think of the port uh, of Chabahar in Iran, which is much closer to India. And of course, you know, you don't really need to go that much west to Bandar Abbas, but Chabahar is much on the east side of Iran. I mean, that if you look at the coast, Iranian coast, and so Chabahar is uh, is much closer. and today you know an indian company is operating one terminal of chabahar port and in fact you know there are a lot of uh, concessions in tariff you know of using of chabahar port given by the port authorities and iran has also announced uh, you know uh, you know these uh, these uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, concessions for use of chabahar port and through the chabahar port 
if you look at the map, it was much easier because Central Asia is then right there, you know, northward, and uh, people were, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, trying to use Chabahar port to promote our goods going up to Afghanistan and Central Asia. Now, before, uh, you know, coming of Taliban, uh, you know, Chabahar port was used by India to send, to send uh, 75,000, uh, you know, metric ton of uh, wheat uh, to Afghanistan, which was part of our aid. Later, Afghan goods on commercial basis, you know, sent in containers, passed through the port of Chabahar and reached India. And so we were showing that you know, Chabahar is viable and let's get into that. Of course, you know, after the coming of Taliban, there is a question mark that what would happen and how we can take the Chabahar port initiative uh, forward, forward. But of course, the Chabahar port has shown one way of how India can quickly reach Central Asia. And if there's an assured uh, connectivity of uh, the trade route, then Chabahar can be the answer and it would really connect India with Uzbekistan and not only Uzbekistan, but the entire Central Asia. So we are working in this direction. And when the Uzbek government, when we talk to Uzbek government, in fact, the government of Uzbekistan actually, uh, you know, took the initiative to organize the first trilateral meeting of India, Uzbekistan and Iran in December of last year to think of that how these three countries can together promote the use of Chabahar port. So there was one meeting already held in December. We would, of course, you know, hold the next meetings, etc. And uh, it's, a, it's a complicated question because it involves completing the infrastructure of roads and railways so that connection is seamless, talking to customs administrations of all the involved countries and how they can cooperate so that, you know, goods reach faster. And of course, with the coming of Taliban in Afghanistan, things are not clear. So, you know, how this would also go forward, uh, whether we can go through Turkmenistan, you know, that's also another question. And, you know, this, these are the complicating factors, but that is the biggest obstacle of, uh, uh, you know, increasing trade and investment in Central Asia. It is not only from India's point of view, from all the countries lying south of uh, Central Asia, because the whole of Central Asia is landlocked. And, you know, uh, they have very few exit routes to ocean. One would be through Russia, the other through, is through China. And the third option could be to come back and go south to the Indian Ocean. And this southern route does not exist actually at this moment of time. Now, of course, we should understand that, that there are competing initiatives in the region also. Each country is thinking in its own way. For China, the answer would be the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI. Of course, India does not endorse BRI. We are not part of that, uh, you know, in fact, uh, there are problems of the BRI and we are, uh, you know, uh, it, it uh, goes through our, uh, you know, sovereign territory, which is under illegal occupation of Pakistan. There's the question of the China-Pakistan economic corridor and all these uh, complicating factors are there. And so you can, one in, in one sense, you can see that, you know, uh, because the geographical nature of the landlocked Central Asia, the other parts who try to come into the region, uh, they get into sometimes they, they get into competing, uh, you know, uh, initiatives. And uh, today in this world, actually, we have to turn that, uh, you know, uh, competing initiatives into some kind of cooperation that we find some optimum solution uh, to, to solve the problem of landlocked Central Asia, which would open a lot of routes uh, for, for us and for everybody. Now, of course, connected with this is the question of Afghanistan. Now, you can see that Afghanistan, uh, Uzbekistan is a direct neighbor of Afghanistan. It shares a land border of about 140 countries. I talked of Hermes. Hermes is on the, you know, the border of, between Afghanistan and Uzbekistan. Now, the other countries of, uh, uh, other bordering countries, the neighbors of uh, Afghanistan also have their own policies towards, uh, you know, Afghanistan, especially after the coming of Taliban. Uh, Uzbekistan believes that uh, they should have a working relationship with uh, Afghanistan, even after that Taliban has come to power. And the embassy of uh, Uzbekistan remains open in, uh, uh, embassy of Uzbekistan remains open in Kabul. In fact, when there were peace talks going between United States and the Taliban political office in Doha, uh, of course, uh, Uzbek uh, uh, delegation and you know, Uzbeks were talking to everybody, all political factions in Kabul, and the Taliban, you know, office in Doha. And, you know, uh, they, there was this Uzbek belief that, you know, the problem has to be solved in a peaceful way. 
and we should try to find a way that you know uzbekistan uh, sorry afghanistan remains united you know peaceful and the solution um, some solution of uh, pol a political solution could emerge of course today uh, you know with the coming of taliban to power uh, things have changed but uh, for uh, uzbekistan you know the situation is something like this that you know there is a, a route uh, going to uh, you know afghanistan which is the southern route that is one of the access points for uzbekistan if uh, uzbekistan is not talking to taliban even that route would end uh, uzbekistan has shown willingness to work with uh, you know the taliban in afghanistan but at the same time uzbekistan has not recognized the taliban government in afghanistan and uzbekistan of course says that you know it would go by you know with in consultation with all the regional powers and regional countries you know uh, how to ensure that uh, you know afghanistan is trouble free uh, terrorists terrorists are not harbored in uh, you know uh, in afghanistan the afghan territory is not used to target third countries by terrorist groups and uh, you know the rights of women and minorities and children and uh, you know uh, other groups in uh, you know uh, afghanistan are protected human rights you know are uh, are observed and with these kinds of conditions whether it would be possible to work with taliban so you know this is the new scenario and of course the uzbek government has has been engaging with taliban and trying to work out a solution in fact uh, you know uh, we have also been in touch with uh, uzbekistan and uh, you know that now we don't have an embassy in kabul and recently there was this delhi regional security uh dialogue on afghanistan which was hosted by uh, you know national security advisor of india uh, you know in delhi and there is the national security advisors of uh, you know other countries uh, you know uh, of the, of the five central asian countries and iran and russia were invited to delhi and the, the uzbek national security advisor uh, mr mahmudov was also there in delhi uh, for this dialogue we have been talking it, it was interesting that india invited uh, pakistan and china also but they did not come Uh, so you know the the dialogue went ahead and that showed also that you know india has its legitimate and very powerful uh, you know concerns and interests in afghanistan and in this you know uh, uzbekistan is also with us you know they came to delhi and participated in our dialogue uh, you know earlier there have been exchanges on afghanistan and we are in regular consultation so you can see that it's a very good example that you know how we can uh, you know uh, commonly uh, tackle a regional challenge Uh, to consult with each other know about uh, you know each other's opinion uh, each other's interest and how to take that uh, that forward so uzbekistan of course uh, you know remains an important player in terms of the policy relating to afghanistan because it is a country which directly shares border with uh, with afghanistan it is not like uh, you know united states or european union you can sit far and talk about many things but here is uzbekistan which just shares the border and uh, you know it has uh, its uh, own very strong views on not to allow refugees from afghanistan to come in uzbekistan and you know these are the countries which would really face the consequence if if the situation really you know erupts and if there is any uh, you know onslaught of terrorists in afghanistan you know uh, going out and spreading further in central asia so these countries are directly threatened by those developments and they are doing their best to tackle these uh, you know questions uh i would uh, in the end talk of uh, how we are uh, cooperating on multilateral stage between india and uh, uzbekistan so far we talked much of bilateral relations but how in the you know on on the multilateral platforms we cooperate so of course india and uzbekistan cooperate very well in the united nations and many other international organizations of course as you know that in any diplomatic relationship uh, we ask each other you know you ask your friends to vote for you when you are standing in some election or they would ask to vote for you when they are standing in some election and we are trying to you know uh, maximize this cooperation and trying to see that whether how much we can we can support each other uzbekistan is a very strong supporter of india uzbekistan has many times publicly declared that when the united nations reforms take place takes place and when uh, the security council is expanded they would like india to be a permanent member of the security council Uh, this is a very emphatic statement from uzbekistan we are very thankful you know to them for this of course uh, we cooperate very closely on the issues relating to you know the global issues uh, on the un platform india is currently a non permanent member of the security council uh, you know 
uh, Uzbekistan because of its growing stature and reforms, uh, which President Mirzia initiated, uh, you know, uh, attained a huge success in elections in the Human Rights Council. And in 2020, Uzbekistan for the first time ever became a member. It was elected to the Human Rights Council. So today, Uzbekistan is a member of the Human Rights Council, and you can understand that you know we cooperate there as well. Uh, so uh, as you know that India is very strongly advocating uh, for many years now, but you know this uh, this campaign has become you know wider and uh, stronger now. That we want from the perspective of developing countries that there is an urgent need for reforms in the United Nations. So the Security Council, in which only you know three countries of Europe. Uh, uh, are represented. There is one America, there is one China. Af Africa is not represented at all. Uh, India with its huge potential, big population, world's sixth largest economy, growing GDP, a uh, lot of contribution to UN peacekeeping and a lot of other you know, important factors. A country like India does not find you know, its voice in the Security Council. And similarly, there are other claimants also from across continents like Germany, Brazil, Japan, etc. And all these countries are, you know, uh, requiring or are the asking for urgent reforms in the uh, United Nations and in all the structures of the United Nations. And we see that, you know, in a lot of times, the UN or the Security Council, they have not been able to solve many conflicts and, uh, you know, challenges, you know, on the global stage. And so for this, India has called for reformed multilateralism, which means that in multilateral institutions, where there's a dominance of just a few countries, it should be part based now. It's already 75 years of the, more than 75 years of the founding of United Nations, and time has come for urgent reforms. So Uzbekistan is also one of the countries with us, which calls for reforms in UN bodies. Of course, that is a good basis for cooperation in the United Nations. Of course, uh, you know, uh, there are, is the issue of terrorism, the international terrorism in our region, which threatens everybody. Uh, this is a concern of uh, terrorism, growing extremism, growing radicalization. And of course, Uzbekistan would not like, you know, these kinds of uh, challenges uh, to be uh, facing Central Asia or its own country. Uzbekistan, uh, you know, is a secular country. It would not like any radical views uh, about religion to destabilize this part of the world. And of course, it resolutely is opposed to all forms of terrorism. Uh, you know, we have a very good cooperation on the platform of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. You know, India is a new member of SCO. We became a member in 2017. And uh, both India and Pakistan were admitted to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The other members are four countries of Central Asia, except Turkmenistan and China and uh, Russia. Uh, Iran, uh, Iran is the latest entrant. I mean, the membership has, uh, has been approved. So uh, you can understand that uh, this entirely covers, uh, you know, the, the region uh, from uh, Russia in north to China in east to India in south. This huge landmass is about, uh, you know, 42% of the world's population. Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a very important platform. And, uh, you know, it provides a good opportunity for the leaders of these countries to meet often. In fact, uh, you know, there are many meetings of Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, happening throughout the year. And uh, there are many meetings at different uh, ministerial levels. So the foreign ministers keep meeting each other. The defense ministers of these countries meet on this platform. The national security advisors meet. And this year, Uzbekistan is has taken over the presidency of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And in the next year, in 2022, the SEO summit will take place in Samarkand. We are all preparing for that, which means that you know, Ashton would become a very uh, you know, active place in terms of all the SEO meetings, and there would be many high-level visits uh, to Tashkent in preparation for the summit in Samarkand. Tashkent is also the seat of one of a very one of uh, a very important body of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is called SCO RATS, Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure. So SCO RATS is a body which is headquartered in Tashkent. And here, the you know, uh, officials from all the SCO countries meet on a permanent basis and they exchange information, anything relating to security, terrorism, uh, you know, making the list of terrorists active in your region and terrorist groups active in your region, how to counter them, you know, uh, you know, by making joint strategies, etc. And, uh, you know, Ashkan is a very active place for SEO rats. And this year, uh, uh, in terms of the rotating presidency of the council, 
of the Council of Estuarats, India has taken over as president. So our role in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is also growing and it is becoming a good platform where Uzbekistan was always there as a, as a founding member. India is a new member. And of course, we depend a lot on Uzbekistan uh, you know, for our activities in SEO. We regularly exchange opinion on various things. We jointly strategize. And, and of course, there's a lot of good cooperation on the stage of, on the India, uh, on, on the SCO stage. The last thing I would like to talk about is the India Central Asia Dialogue. Now, uh, as you know that uh, for the big parts of the world, Central Asia looks as one entity. Of course, you know you ca you cannot just homogenize. Of course, uh, there are a lot of uh, you know cultural things which are different or local conditions which be different in different uh, you know countries of Central Asia. But of course, Central Asia together also finds a voice as one region, and a lot of countries have established dialogue with Central Asia. So there is a dialogue uh, which is. Central Asia, Japan dialogue, so five countries of Central Asia and Japan, Central Asia, South Korea, Central Asia, European Union, Central Asia, US, Central Asia, Russia. And of course, India Central Asia dialogue also started in the year 2019. It started from Samarkand. And in fact, it was a joint initiative proposed by India and Uzbekistan. Then External Affairs Minister Shrimati Sushma Swaraj and Foreign Minister of Uzbekistan, Mr. Abdulaziz Kamilov, jointly wrote invitation letters to rest of the foreign ministers of the Central Asian countries. And they also invited Afghanistan's foreign minister as a special invitee. And for the first time, India-Central Asia dialogue took place in Samarkand in January of 2019, where India, the five countries of Central Asia, and Afghanistan were present. Together, we discussed that what are the common challenges of the region, how India and Central Asia can work together, what can happen for connectivity, and what can happen to help the situation in Afghanistan. These kinds are, of issues are very important issues for the entire region. These do not belong to just one or two countries, and it is very important for this dialogue to take place. The second round of this dialogue took place in uh, October uh, 2020 in Delhi uh, in the online format, because the pandemic conditions did not allow you know, uh, for uh, people to meet together. And uh, we are thinking soon to have the third round, probably physically, you know, we are trying to find the best opportunity so that all the Central Asian uh, foreign ministers and Indian external affairs minister can meet together. So this is an ongoing process and it has led to many interesting results also on the site. For example, now there is an India Central Asia Business Council, which was founded in February, 2020, uh, you know, where one nominated leading chamber of commerce from each of the Central Asian country and India, uh, you know, were brought together on a platform to discuss and uh, propose ways that how trade and investment between India and Central Asia can grow. Uh, FICCI uh, is the leading chamber of commerce from the Indian side, which is hosting this India Central Asia Business Council. So, you know, in terms of business, in terms of, you know, government to government relationship, issues like Afghanistan, et cetera. The Indian, India Central Asia dialogue has taken off and it is doing very well. And of course, there's a lot of potential for this to, to go forward. So you can see that, you know, uh, in a variety of ways, uh, you know, we are trying to expand our relationship with Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is as a landlocked country, you know, which has limited possibilities to engage with the outside world directly, also constrained by the fact of the, you know, challenges of connectivity is still trying to have, you know, good relations and a very vibrant, uh, you know, uh, partnership with uh, India. Both countries are sparing no efforts to branch into all possible directions uh, to improve and, you know, expand and strengthen their bilateral relationship. In fact, uh, during the times of COVID also, there was very good, uh, you know, uh, uh, cooperation. You know, India had sent medicines to, to Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan uh, deployed its aircraft to evacuate citizens from India back to Uzbekistan or Indian citizens standard into in Uzbekistan were sent to to India. These kinds of cooperation took place in the at the height of the second wave of uh, Corona pandemic in India in May. Uzbekistan also sent its you know oxygen concentrators and other medicines to us as a symbol of uh, a friend, which is a friend you know in in times of need. So you know we really acknowledge that we have a very good a very heart to heart relationship with people of Uzbekistan and people of Central Asia. And it is in the interest of both countries 
to find diplomatic ways to strengthen our cooperation in all areas because in today's world when opportunities are opening if not uh, directly uh, you know physically connected you can be connected digitally uh, you know so in terms of it in terms of trade in terms of culture in terms of uh, you know a lot of other issues just of education exchange of knowledge there are plenty of opportunities and i think that india and uzbekistan not forgetting the fact that we were once direct neighbors and even though today we are not direct neighbors but we should find means to connect with each other again and benefit from each other uzbekistan a population of 35 million uh, people india a population of 1.3 billion people you know these market should be open to both countries for each other and of course it would lead to a lot of and it would lead to a lot of uh, exciting possibilities in the future so uh, here i would like to end and uh, of course i look forward to any comments from the chair from faculty and from our dear students thank you very much thank you sir thank you for this vibrant and enriching lecture Uh, and enlightening us on the history polity and convergence between both the countries india and uzbekistan talking about how importance has been given to hindi language over there from the cultural ties to the emerging situations from bilateral issues to multilateral you have uh, you have plethora of knowledge about everything with um the uh, two nations and uh, it was a kind of outreach of knowledge from india to uzbekistan uzbekistan to india thank you sir uh, unlearning to learning towards now uh, the floor is open to our um, uh, faculties and chair and the students who would like to come in and put questions forward uh, there are few questions uh, that i can see in the chat box uh This is a question from Jitesh. Uh, how can Tashkent help to New Delhi for Central Asia connectivity? Uh, so, uh, would you like to answer one by one, or uh, should I present yeah, all the questions? Yeah, right, right. I mean, the, let me let me take the questions one by one. Whatever you would say, you know, I would try to offer my comments. But of course, I am happy to hear, you know, comments of. Uh, all the senior faculty members also okay. present okay. here who are so knowledgeable but let me let me uh, you know answer this uh, try to answer this about how uzbekistan can help us in terms of central asia connectivity and i was in fact talking about this uh, look uh, you know what is the the basic problem here is that geographically since there is no connectivity between india and central asia we have to find one route if not one many routes but you know at least even one would be enough and it, everything is very costly in terms of infrastructure investment which is required we are talking of thousands of kilometers of roads railways uh, you know border checkpoints uh, you know customs operations etc for this thing to work actually so so what is happening actually that we found that uh, at least from india's uh, from india's point of view Uh, we wanted to promote the chabahar port uh, you know an indian company is operating one terminal of the chabahar port and so we are right there uh, the chabahar port itself was an initiative taken by india iran and afghanistan to a trilateral agreement and chabahar port agreement was signed and under this the government of iran provided uh, the location of chabahar port there is some investment from india to make the harbor and port better and uh, then there were duty concessions or uh, you know tariff concessions in terms of use of the jabahar port announced by government of iran and we as uh, you know uh, uh, port operators and uh, we are trying to uh, you know uh, trying to see that you know this becomes a port of choice for any exporter exporting to uh, to central asia and in fact the usage of jabahar port is increasing i mean that you know, there are containers coming as far as from australia Uh, you know japan southeast asia uh, you know even europe uh, and and of course then you know the, the goods uh, go northward but of course as i told you that there are problems there are problems of uh, missing railway infrastructure in sections uh, though of course iran is trying to work out and uh, trying to lay rail links uh, you know there was a route through afghanistan but after coming of taliban this is a bit unclear at this moment that what used what would happen in fact if you would remember uh, you know around uh, uh, you know in in the first decade of this century 
India had made the road in Afghanistan, which is called Zaran's Bilaram, which which linked uh, the the ring uh, sort of ring road, you know, inside uh, Afghanistan, which linked all the major cities, and so you know that was one way to to reach Kabul basically through through this route. Uh, of course, there is other possibility of uh, not going to Afghanistan but going through Turkmenistan. But then there's a problem of you know the different gauge of railway. Uh, if you remember, the Soviet gauge of railway was different, and you know what Iran has is different. So you need to have at the border some kinds of facility where you know either the goods are loaded to other wagons or the wagons change their wheels and then go forward. So these are all very costly propositions and. It is it is beyond the purview of one country or two countries to invest that much. So many countries would have to come together, maybe the international financial institutions, etc. And as I told you, that there are uh, other initiatives also. Uzbekistan itself was uh, you know uh, trying to see that whether the Trans Afghan Railway Corridor can can work, uh, which means that you know linking Uzbekistan with Pakistan uh, through railway connection crossing Afghanistan. This is also complicated. Uh, you know, there is, of course, the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So there are these kinds of initiatives. Now, government of Uzbekistan has been very vocal. You know, uh, of course, they have uh, their multiple partners. You know, they, they need not choose their partners. But, you know, at least they also are paying close attention to all the initiatives. And they, of course, have been very helpful with the Chabahar Initiative. And in fact, as I told in my uh, talk also that, uh, you know, uh, the first trilateral initiative uh, on Chabahar port was organized on the initiative of government of Uzbekistan, which means that you know if we really need to promote the Chabahar port initiative, then the governments, uh, you know, involved governments of Central Asia, Iran, and India would have to think together that what we can all do to promote uh, Chabahar port and build further railway railroads, you know, or the or the roads uh, for the connectivity to be established. The other thing is that let us not only talk of the road connectivity, let's talk of air connectivity also. In fact, there was uh, you know, one uh, uh, view that uh, let's have uh, regular air cargo services between India and Central Asia. Of course, Uzbekistan can be also one hub, but it was more in terms of Indian Central Asia. Today, as you know, that uh, there is uh, only one flight connection uh, which operates between Tashkent and uh, Delhi, and that too is run by Uzbek Airways no Indian carrier is flying to Central Asia. Uh, and there is so much demand in terms of passengers going to India or from India coming to Central Asia that the load is there, the passenger demand is there, but there is only one route which is operating. In fact, it is because of pandemic that you know we have only one uh, you know flight operating per week, but you know in uh, pre-pandemic uh, period, actually there were 15 flights from Ashton to India every week. And then there were flights from other countries also. Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, etc. All that is stopped in the pandemic period. And these are mainly passenger flights. There were no dedicated air cargo flights operating between Delhi. So, you know, it's a question that since air cargo route does not exist, the trade, at least in perishable goods or high value, value goods, uh, would not take off. Or, uh, you know, the, whether the trade should come first and then the cargo services would be established, it's a chicken and egg question. I think that you know all the governments would have to think together. There also, you know, Uzbekistan can help by you know thinking with us that what we can do to promote air connectivity and road connectivity. So I think that you know there is uh, no simple answer that uh, what can be done because it's it's more of a technical thing that you know what all we need to do, how much investment we need. But in terms of willingness to work together, of course, Uzbekistan, the government of Uzbekistan is very willing to work with us in these matters. I think that that is how Uzbekistan can help us establish connectivity between India and Central Asia. And it is not only for the benefit of uh, Central Asia, it is also for the benefit of India. Thank you, Thank sir. You. I would like to invite uh, uh, faculty or fellows or our director, sir, for in comments. Shubra, I think um, some uh, faculty members have raised questions. Uh, Okay. Uh, out of curiosity, I think Ashish Kumar Shuklu teaches political science at uh, Satyavati College would like to raise one question. Okay. Yes, you can directly invite him. Yeah, Ashish. Uh, yes. Please sir. ask. Uh, yeah. 
please ask written the question in the chat box also but you can speak okay. yeah yeah ashish please uh, go on speak your question uh, we can't see yes, your sir. video sir, thank you thank you thank you uh, बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद को मिला इंडिया 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 उज़बेकिस्तान पर मेरा क्वेश्चन मैंने वैसे इंटरनेशनल नॉर्थ साउथ ट्रांसपोर्ट कॉरिडोर एंड चाबार So, so do you think that uh, these projects uh, uh, have the potential uh, to come to Chinese footprint in the region? Uh, <clears throat> Let me say that uh, uh, you know, uh, if we put it in those terms that uh, INSTC is to counter China, you know, or uh, Chabahar is to counter China. then automatically any host government or uzbekistan government would say that we are not in it i mean that no why would the uzbek government collaborate with you to come to china uh, you know when they have good relations with china uh, you know that china and iran also have very good relations in international relations terms you know i mean that no uh, when you talk to your uh, diplomatic uh, you know uh, partners friends etc i would not say that uh, we are doing this uh, initiative because we have to counter china you know regardless of the china factor of course china is a huge country it's a big power of course it's a big power in the region which shares direct borders with uh, many central asian countries has a huge influence in the region but uh, you know uh, our initiatives for our ports and our roads are for their own sake and for for our own sake i mean we want to have great links between india and central asia to just promote our trade and investment it is not about countering any third country you know let us think of in this way also please think that the international north south transport corridor was visualized in the year 2000 when there was no built and road initiative that is why i am saying that you know india is one of the leading countries of the region which started to think of transcontinental connectivity you know and uh, you know uh, linking south asia with uh, with uh, even up to russia at that time there was no pri so you know today you know in the days of uh, you know after the announcement of bri and india is not uh, you know endorsing bri all these questions arise that how do you it, uh, you know uh, uh, counter the influence of china well i mean that you know it's uh, it, it's a uh, uh, you know if you really get into this kind of power games and equations Uh, it would become very tough for you know the conduct of international relations and you know you you will not find partners for that so you know our agenda is always positive we are talking to uzbekistan we are talking to all our uh, partner countries to promote inspc to promote uh, chaba and to promote other initiatives we are not there just for uh, the sake of uh, you know uh, countering any third country so that is my question of course from other point of view you know let's put it in this way uh you know if there are different kinds of trade routes and the connectivities in the region for the countries in the region in central asia which again is landlocked there are various options then i mean that you know they are today looking for various options because countries of central asia if they want to exit to ports they today have only two options well, one is through russia you know or the baltics basically going north or one is through china going east actually so if true in two uh, exit routes are already existing and yet they want to think of a third option to go to indian ocean let's take it positively that this, this provides us opportunity to work together and not in terms of just countering any third thank you sir so uh, thank shubra you i just take shubra just take last question because uh, okay. uh, yeah then we have uh, to invite bhuvan sir for vote of thanks mm -hmm. so i just wanted to ask uh, not ask but just wanted to know your perspective on uh, new education policy uh, 2020 as you mentioned about three private universities um, uh, working in uzbekistan so how can we strengthen because this is the uh, this is a kind of a global model that we have adopted you know new education policy how we can strengthen 
the bilateral uh, ties, uh, education ties, you know, research exchanges or uh, skill development programs, you know, in, uh, emphasis on that. I just wanted to know your perspective on that. Uh, uh, thank you very much. This is a very, uh, you know, interesting and very uh, important question. Uh, government of Uzbekistan is very much uh, wanting to, uh, you know, adopt its education policy to the new realities of the world. So as I said, that the president of Uzbekistan, in fact, you know, came out with a policy a few months back, and he said that each Uzbek student passing out from the university should know at least two foreign languages, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, and so, so not only Russian, I mean, that's, you know, it can be English, it can be German, or it can be Chinese, or, or it can be Hindi. So, you know, there is a very clear emphasis by a state that learn more foreign languages because you have to connect with the outside world. The second thing is that you know, revitalizing the education system of Uzbekistan. Now they have come out with a system called presidential schools. So uh, in the regions of Afghanistan, on, of Uzbekistan, there are 14 presidential schools established. These schools are like you know those uh, talent centers where best of the talented children are brought together to live in a boarding environment inside the school premises with best of international teachers, uh, you know, uh, invited and to, to work in these schools with best of lab conditions, language labs, et cetera. You know, I have visited a few of the presidential schools. The children have been very confident, speak very good English. They have uh, taken you to their IT labs. Uh, they, they show that what they're doing with uh, robots and artificial intelligence, uh, you know, what they're doing in the gym, swimming pool and football, et cetera. The best thing is that Uzbekistan today also is looking for, uh, you know, uh, through international, uh, you know, recruitment agencies to recruit Indian teachers. And of course, we have a lot to offer, you know, so, so you know, Indian teachers can come and find the employment opportunities in schools in Uzbekistan. Of course, you know, uh, it, it, it is left to everybody's, uh, you know, expectations of remuneration, et cetera, et cetera. Then uh, the colleges are, uh, you know, uh, all the Uzbekistan colleges and the universities of Uzbekistan are looking for more international partnerships. So, you know, there are, uh, you know, varieties of MOUs. The Indian Council for Cultural Relations has MOUs with three universities in Uzbekistan, two in Ashkan, one in Samarkand for establishment of short-term Indian chairs. And uh, though at this moment, all these chairs are empty, you know, but, uh, you know, Indian uh, professors can come. Uh, of course, ICCR would bear the expenses and they can teach in these universities being resident here, you know, for, for a semester or, or even more and teach different kinds of, uh, you know, uh, courses. Of course, English and IT remains in high demand. Then, you know, of course, uh, there are uh, universities in Uzbekistan who have on their own independent basis brought professors from India and have kept them in the university to, you know, uh, give a lot of, uh, to strengthen their faculties and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, their teaching basically. And the Indian embassy has been establishing India study rooms in various universities of Uzbekistan, which are just, you know, rooms dedicated to the teaching of India. Their library is equipped with uh, books on India. And we have provided smart boards through internet. You connect with a university in India and all in exchanges of lectures, etc. In fact, the universities in Uzbekistan and where these India study rooms are functioning, they are very much eager to sign MOUs with Indian universities so that you know there can be some kind of understanding to teach course accredited where Indian professors can give even online lectures. Of course, in pandemic conditions, it was not possible to travel. Hopefully, that travel restrictions would also be lifted. And so we have uh, you know we have these online courses also happening. In fact, from you as you know, people from the teaching community who have all the knowledge, who are welcome to tie up, uh, and of course the MC would be very happy to work as uh, you know a, a mediator between you and the institutions here to have MOUs and conduct let's conduct online lectures from India for Uzbek students. So there's plenty of opportunities, and so Indian private universities have started to come, and they're opening their campuses here. So we are encouraging more and more universities to come. So this is the you know the prospect in education basically. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I would like to request our deputy director, a convener of this series, uh, Dr. Bhuvan, sir, to give the vote of thanks. Doctor, over to you, Dr. Bhuvan, sir. Thank you, Shubhra. Uh, we have had, uh, we had a very 
enlightening, wonderful lecture. The 75th year of India's independence and the 30th year of Uzbekistan's independence converges here. And we were just given this new name to two months back, the Center for Global Studies. We transformed from the developing countries this is center to the Center for Global Studies. And uh, what a wonderful beginning we have made. And thank you so much, uh, Manish Prabhaji, for agreeing to our request to grace the occasion. And uh, incidentally, it has turned out that india Uzbekistan relationship, if we want to take up global studies, and if we want to inform ourselves well about uh, our relationship with countries outside India, then Uzbekistan can be the entry point because of two reasons, for the current strategic and business and cultural exchanges, and also the ancient Indian linkages, going from, as uh, Mr. Manish Prabhatji rightly pointed out, going back to the ancient prehistoric period, and then through the excavations that we have found uh, Buddhist sculpture, Buddhist pieces there, and how the entire place, the entire Central Asia, these countries were part of the silk and spice route. So thank you so much, sir. And we have got, it was like a graphical journey. We, I was, we were visualizing a movie in front of us where India and Uzbekistan are placed very close to each other. And, and we were very happy to know, of course, we had heard about Raj Kapoor's popularity in the erstwhile Soviet Union, but we also learned about how, uh, how popular our own uh, Mithun Chakravarti is in that part of the world. From the literary perspective, you talked about the Indian and uh, the Hindi and Urdu words finding their place in the Uzbek uh, vocabulary. And coming to the strategic partnership and the huge potential of, big potential of uh, industrial or business exchanges. We are extremely thankful to you, sir, for agreeing to come and uh, we will upload this lecture on YouTube and on Facebook and I'm sure the generations to come can benefit from this and, and this will be a big contribution to the academics also. Thank you, Professor uh, Sunil Chaudhary for uh, preparing the blueprint of an ambassadorial lecture series and he instantly got this idea and prepared a blueprint and put different people in different tasks as he does all the time. And Shubhra Pant uh, quickly agreed to our request to anchor, anchor the entire show. There are many people who are working in the background. Shalini and Dhirendra Deshmukh are taking care of this Zoom platform. Professor Sanjeev Singh, the director of Computer Center, he provided us with this Zoom connectivity. Nitin Dawar, who is a senior programmer there, facilitated the entire show. And uh, our uh, many fellows have also come, many students of political science, history, and other departments, many senior faculty members I can see have also joined this particular show. I'm extremely thankful to you, sir. And Garima, who is there in Israel now, is coordinating the YouTube link, and Chandrasekhar, who is in BHU, is also taking care of the Facebook link. And with these words, uh, we, we will conclude today's lecture, and we would request uh, the ambassador Manish Prabhatji to connect with our future programs also and to uh, to share this uh, YouTube lecture when it gets uploaded and hope to stay connected sir, with you and I'm sure this center will only grow from here. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. So nice. Thank you. Thank you.